Please be seated wherever you are. Can I ask everybody under the sound of my voice? Because I will not tell you again at the end of the service. What is your heart's desire? He that inhabits the praises of Israel is here. Talk to him now. Make your demands and your requests known to him. Here is my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here is my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. Nam imel chokike imel. Nam imel to you. Lay his hands upon you. The Lord make a way for you where there appears to be no way. Turn your desires into testimonies. The Lord remember you for good. He that remembered Mephibosheth remember you. He that remembered Joseph remember you. He that remembered Hannah, remember you. 
He that remembered Mordecai, remember you. The God of all flesh, visit you. With a transforming, elevating, establishing visitation. The Lord do exceeding abundantly above anything you could think to ask or to imagine. For his own name's sake and to his glory. In every area of your life. In Jesus' mighty name. May the week ahead of you be filled with testimonies. Behold, a great and effectual door is opened unto you. The adversaries are eliminated by fire. Possess your possessions in the name of Jesus Christ. Prosper, excel, be established to God's glory. For his own name's sake. In Jesus mighty name. Thank you father. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Great God. Can somebody say he's my God. Hallelujah. Today we must conclude vows. The Lord has eloquently prolongedly spoken on this issue of vows. Why? Because it is of capital importance. A soldier well equipped who knows how to use his weapons is a dangerous man. Ask Rambo. Ask who? Rambo. One man riot squad. One man army. But if the Holy Ghost be for you and you understand and you understand your weapons in the realm of the spirit, you know when, where, and how to deploy them. Satan has no answer, no remedy, and no resistance against you. You are a man who will accomplish destiny. You are one delivered to be a deliverer. Amen. You are God's champion on the face of the earth. Amen. The Bible says, don't you recognize that you are his weapons of warfare and his multitudes threshing instruments. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Am I talking to somebody here? And the vow is one of the most potent weapons God has given us on the earth. But just like every potent weapon, handle with care. Because if it discharges wrongly, it can do devastating damage. People have devastated their destinies with the vow that should have promoted them into their promised land. Misuse of the vow is deadly. Proper use of the vow can lift you from any situation and transform your life. A vow improperly used, carelessly made, can make the voice of a Christian an irritation in the ears of the Most High God. We saw that in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Not just that that voice becomes an irritation, in God's ears. But in chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes from verses 1 to 7. God says it goes to the extent where he, God, becomes so offended with a man who makes a vow and does not fulfill it. That he begins even to destroy the, man, the works of the man's hands. As well as the fact that his voice becomes an irritation to him. We discover that a vow is a promise. To worship God sometime in the future with something of meaningful, tangible value. Something that costs you something. Or with a service that you accept to do unto him in return for something you are asking him to do for you. The word meaningful comes in here because 
Let's stop saying I vowed a vow to God. What did you vow? You vowed to dance in church if he answers your prayer. Everybody dances in church on Sunday. But don't tell us story. When you want to vow a vow, you vow something to God that pains you. If it doesn't pain you, it can't pull God's hand down for you. I will roll on the altar. Everybody rules on the altar. I will sing for him. Even children sing from the day they start crying. They're making melody unto the Lord. Do something meaningful, my friend. Stop insulting God. Look, let's call it let's call a spade a spade. Study people who made vows that changed destinies. And you see people who parted with great things. Hannah had been without a child for ages. They give him to me. I will give him back to you immediately. Uh, let me remain without a child the rest of my life. Just let it be said that I was pregnant and I had a baby. So where is the baby? The baby is walking in the house of God. And immediately the baby was weaned. She fulfilled her promise. Great men make great vows to God. Things that if they let go of, something will change in their life. Knowing that what they are expecting God for, to do for them will change not just their lives but their entire destinies. We saw that your vow can cause God to move ten times more massively in every area of your life. The vow can provoke ten times more in every area of your life. From Daniel 1 verse 8, the Hebrew boy is led by Daniel decided to make a vow of abstinence, refused to eat the food contaminated by dedication to idols, separated themselves without father's supervision, separated themselves without mother's supervision, but because they feared God. When they were tested, they were ten times healthier. When they were tested, they were ten times wiser than the king's wisest advisors. Are you surprised that Daniel survived ten regimes as prime minister? Every king that came in needed Daniel. Every king that came in needed Daniel. When your regime ends, they sideline you. When Buhari leaves government, most of the people with him are going home. Am I talking to somebody here? It is normal in change of button. Now that Clinton and, um, what's his name? Obama are out of office. All their people are being changed. It is normal in political circles. But a man who vowed a vow of abstinence, every king that came, every king that came wanted Daniel to serve him. Why? Your abstinence makes you Ten times more valuable, more powerful, more successful, more, more impactful than your colleagues. If it is a vow unto the Lord. Praise the living God. So I say to anybody under the sound of my voice, all heads are equal. You can make your head ten times more equal than those of your colleagues. How? Your vow. Use of the vow with wisdom and understanding. No wonder Second Timothy tells us in chapter 2. In every house, there are many vessels. Wooden vessels, they, plastic, they, enamel, they. But you, you're one of these ordinary vessels. If you want to distinguish yourself, he says, if a man purge himself, make a vow of abstinence, apply restraints, and hear me, what are we talking about? The young man that says, I will honor God with sexual purity in my youth as I am growing. Why? Because, Lord, you will set me in my home. Give me my own spouse. Not all this management marriage. Give me better husband, better wife. I can wait. I will honor you with my purity. God will keep us part of the bargain. Abstinence. Where I am walking, I will not steal. I will not do what other people are doing. Why? Because I fear God. And I am serving as unto the Lord. God will visit you in a, in a different way there. In 
the same place that other people are doing what they're doing casually. You're doing your own with conscious in the teaching that followed. If you were absent in the Sunday school period, I like I said to you, it's very, very sorry for you. Look at the late comers and ask them, when did you arrive here? Okay, look at somebody near you, ask him, when did you come? Tell him, were you part of Sunday school? You don't know what you're missing. The teaching of this morning, small, brief presentation of 20, 25 minutes by John Maxwell, you can digest it for the rest of your life and you will not exhaust it. But if you implement what he taught in those 25 minutes, wherever you find yourself, you reign as king. You will stand out in the crowd. You will distinguish yourself. It's one of those teachings like 360 degrees leadership that picks a man from the... Look, it doesn't take every, knowing everything to become great. There are a few things that if you know a master, every other thing will follow. This teaching is one of them. That's why I, this is third. Next week, we're going to teach it again. Sunday school. We're going to apply it, teach it... For, Beyond application in church, application in your business, application in every area of your life. The vow is like that. If you understand and apply it relevantly, my God, your lifting will shock your generations. We began to look at people in the Bible who practiced making and honoring vows and how it affected the history and story of their life. We started with Hannah, a woman barren. A woman not just barren, but barren by reason of satanic oppressions. Barren because there was an enemy, a household enemy. I would want to believe and tell you that Penina was the problem. And how do I know this? In 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 12, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, you should understand that the Hebrew language is a picture language. When you call Jehovah as Lord of hosts, you're calling him by a specific name, the Lord God of Sabaoth. And what is the meaning of that? The commander of the hosts of heaven and hell. When do you invoke him in that manner? When it is spiritual warfare. She was not talking of barrenness ordinarily. She would then have invoked him as El Shaddai, the multi-breasted nourisher of Israel. If what she wanted was only fruitfulness, she would have spoken to Jehovah El Shaddai. I want to be fruitful. Am I talking to somebody here? But she recognized that something was preventing her fruitfulness. She made her vow to the Lord of hosts. I need military intervention. I need forceful intervention. Penina came from her father's house with all her father's juju to shut my womb here. And you're the only God I call upon. Every year I come to worship you. He said, all your worship, what does it add up to? Boom, now let us see. And the mockery got to the level where she vowed a vow. And she vowed the vow to the Lord of hosts. Because she recognized it was spiritual warfare. Am I talking to somebody here? And the vow broke the yoke, opened the door. She had the baby. The Bible says, look, this, uh, there's only one place in the whole Bible where the Bible says, and God remembered a Christian who used to come every year to church. But when she comes, God does not see her. And when she prayed her prayer, she specifically said in that verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, scriptures please. And she vowed and said unto, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction, affliction, I'm afflicted. This is satanic oppression. I am afflicted. The affliction of thy handmaid. And remember me and not forget thine handmaid. The woman knew that something had covered her. She was obfuscated. A veil was over her life. She needed the cloud of darkness to be driven out. So she vowed a vow. Just give me a son. And the Bible account says, And God remembered 
Hannah. I don't care if the native doctor is living in the house. Whether it is your mother-in-law, your father-in-law. If you make a vow powerful enough, Jehovah will move on your behalf. Amen. Your amen sounds like last week's week. Yeah. And the husband slept with the wife and God remembered. Means God had forgotten. How does God, the almighty, the alpha and the omega, the all-knowing, omniscient God, forget a human being? I'll tell you why. A spiritual covering cast over you can make you to be forgotten when others are remembered. It is a spiritual manipulation. She has been hidden, covered. Some people are covered in their office. Some people are covered in their family. Some people are covered in their business place. Some shops and business places are covered. A vow will uncover the covered. Am I talking to somebody here? A powerful enough vow. Do this for me. And I will do this for you. And Hannah's vow uncovered her. And Jehovah remembered her. She delivered a son. And quickly, quickly, one year plus old, not even up to two years, she took the boy to the temple with diaper, napkin, feeding bottle, and lactogen and dropped all of them on the altar. Now, milk, all of them. I'm not going to carry go from here. Hannah mocked her more. He said, don't worry. I have fulfilled my vow. If God wants, let him. She didn't pray again. She didn't ask for a child again, but God gave her five more. Am I talking to somebody here? The door that had been closed opened suddenly. And children started coming every year, every year. Why? Thou. Thou. Look at somebody say, master key. Master key. She paid immediately. She didn't waste time. We saw that as one of the secrets. Hannah's testimony can be your testimony. Then the next one we saw. Of people who vowed and whose vows changed their entire story. Was whom? Jacob. Jacob. What was Jacob's bow, vow all about, about? Hunted by his brother. When a hunter tells you I'm hunting you, you're in trouble. When a man who runs deers down and kills them. Tells you run to where you like, I'll get you. The only thing keeping me is let daddy die. Soon as your daddy and my daddy dies, <laughs> I will hunt you down and kill you. The young man knew he was in trouble. So he ran for dear life while daddy was still alive. He ran in panic because he didn't even have a second change of clothes to use as pillow that night. And where he slept, he had a dream and saw Jehovah at the top of the ladder. And angels ascending and descending. And he spoke when he woke up. What a terrible place. But Jehovah, since this is your place. And I'm going away empty handed. All I have is my walking stick. And this bottle of anointing oil. I make you a vow. I am empty handed today. But I anoint the stone. As a pledge. Prosper me and keep me in the way that I go. And bring me back safe. Everything you give me, I'll give you 10% of it. And you will be my God and I'll build you a house here. He poured oil on the ground. When Laban began to cheat him where he was walking, Laban didn't know he was cheating a man with a vow. A man with a vow is a dangerous man. A man with a vow is a man you cannot handle. A man with a vow is a man on whose side Jehovah has taken position. In whose boat the master is fully awake. Because even Jacob himself was at the point, desperate point of giving up. When his, his two wives, Leah was producing children like every other year. And then the other one, Rachel, began to produce as well. And suddenly he had 12 sons. It was as if he woke up from sleep. Otio, 12 sons. What will I tell them I was doing all these years? What heritage will I leave for them? When they're grown and they ask me for the inheritance, what will I tell them? These same boys can kill me in anger. So the man got up and went to his father-in-law and said, enough is enough. I don't walk again. 
I'm leaving right now. The man didn't come to negotiate. His mind was made up. I'm going. It was at that time that Laban told him, I know what I've been doing to you. I've been dealing with you. Reviewing your salaries downwards while I've been increasing. But I know that it's your anointing and your favor and your grace that is prospering me. When you carry a vow, the vow speaks around you. Am I talking to somebody here? So the man said, oh, so you knew it's me that's causing this thing to happen in your house. I'm going anyway. The one that you've enjoyed, continue. The man said, don't go. Tell me your wages. He said, my wages. You want to hear it. Please. Remove all the colored cattle. Leave me with only white cattle. But after this, any cattle that has color other than white is my own. Ha! Laban said, I thought this boy had sense before. He's a fool. If I remove all the colored cattle and leave him only white cattle, mating with white cattle, they will only produce what? White cattle. Is he sick or something wrong with him? He has now cheated himself the final, final one. This is that. This one said no wages at all. So he's working for me for free. For where? He didn't know he was dealing with a man with a vow. And Jehovah came in the night and said, Do you see what I'm showing you in the dream? He said, What is it? He said, Poplar wood. Where the cattle mate. And the result will be colored cattle. Do it. The secret of genetic engineering was given to a man because of the vow. Look, I did a little analysis. Genesis 31 from 7. And I saw at least seven, eight things that were provoked by the vow in this young man's life. Genesis 31 verse 7. And your father, this is um, Jacob talking to his wives as he called them out to tell them we're leaving. And your father had deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. The vow that he made, number one, provoked the mystery of divine sustenance. Everything is reducing. Your family is increasing. And you didn't starve. How do you explain it? Am I talking to anybody here? Somehow the mystery of the vow paid made the little that existed enough. Then number two, divine protection. But God suffered him not to hurt me. Meaning what? I know that in his heart, he didn't wish me well. He would have killed me. But God did not allow him. The vow provoked mystery of divine sustenance and divine protection. The vow. Verse 8, if he said to us, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said to us, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. Uh -uh. Is God Oshakala or Shokolo? But if you're a man with a vow, whatever favors you is what God will do. That is, it provokes divine, inexplicable divine favor. If Look, it is the equivalent of saying because of your vow and your financial estate and what's going on in your finances and the vow you made about your finances. When dollar decides to rise, all you will have in your hand is dollar. And dollar will shoot up to the maximum. On the day you finish your dollar, dollar will drop. And naira will be happening and you will be filled with naira everywhere. Am I talking to somebody here? Everything works together for your good. When you have begun to key into the mystery of the vow. Economy good, it's good for you. Economy bad, it is good for you. Whatever is happening to economy is good for you. Praise the living God. Or don't you know that people are the richest they have ever been now. That the economy is the worst it has ever been. It's just working out perfectly for them. Praise the living God. Verse 9. Thus, God had taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Favor has a replacement factor. The replacement factor of favor began to speak for him. That is what happened with the little girl in the book of Esther called Esther. 
when the queen of the whole country misbehaved for the first time. Why? It was Esther's time to shine. It was her time to replace him. Uh, replace her, sorry. Am I talking to somebody here? So favor's replacement factor begins to speak to your advantage. In the company where you work, where you supply small, small things, it is that, that period you have entered and because of your vow, the company that has been supplying them for years will make one careless mistake and somebody will say, no, we cannot stand this. Hey, but it's a small mistake, we should forgive them. So, no, we cannot. And while they're still talking, say, uh -huh. you sure you've been with us for some time? Can you supply this? Me? Yeah, I said you. Can you supply it? We will pay you in advance. Uh, yes, sir, I can supply it. And that's it. Why? Replacement factor of favor. Replacement factor of favor. Began to speak on his behalf. Laban lost everything and he got everything Laban lost. Genesis 31 verse 10. In fact, by the mystery of the vow, you can't be fought to. Anybody fighting you, you will replace the person. Amen. Or the person will be replaced by somebody that will favor you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 10, and it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up my eyes, saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of the Lord spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that live and dwell unto thee. Divine revelation and insight. You begin to see and hear what others cannot see. You begin to hear what others cannot hear. God begins to give you secret of things that are to happen in future so that you prepare today. To maximize the benefits. By reason of what? Vow. And then something else. Anybody who touches you is in trouble. Divine vengeance. Why? He said, I have seen all that Liban doeth unto thee. And I'm going to pay Liban back. Divine vengeance. Then verse 13. I am the God of Bethel where thou anointest a pillar. You didn't have anything. You just made me a vow and poured oil on the crown. But I remembered it and I remember the vow. And where thou vowest the vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. This was how many years before he went to, after, sorry, he went to Lebanon and said, I'm going. Hear me, child of God, and listen very well. Many people have walked out of what they were working on just as what they were working on was about to start working for them. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Many people have labored in one job and the day you got up and said, I'm tired of all this, what is all this? I'm putting your resignation letter. The next week, everything changed and had you been there, you'd have gone to the top. Many people have made that mistake. And Laban was about to make the same mistake. I mean, Jacob was about to make the same mistake. He went to, had he left when he went to Laban, he would have left empty-handed with 12 sons and many daughters, so many mouths to feed, he would have died a pauper. But Jehovah said, dear, dear, not now, not yet. But I'm angry, cool down. But I am hungry, Cool down. But I don't like it. Cool down. On the day God called him out and said, now go. By the time he said, now go, everything Laban had was in his pocket. Had he left years and earlier, when he wanted to leave, he would have left the papa. I prophesy over somebody. By the mystery of the vow, the on time unction will be upon your life. Time, every time you will do everything you should do. Because God will instruct you. Even when you feel like moving ahead of him, he'll say no. He will keep you there to bless you there. He will do what? Keep you there to bless you there. Until he has blessed you. And if the blessing is not there, he will move you to where it is. 
That's what it is. You'll be in the right place. In fact, you'll be synchronized with God's divine timing by mystery of vow. I pray for somebody. Learn to vow vows and pay vows and change your life thereby in Jesus' mighty name. We saw Jonah in the belly of the whale. He prayed, nothing happened. He sang, nothing happened. He murmured, nothing happened. He said, I am down in the deep at the bottom of the mountain. Nothing happened. Then he said, I will pay that that I have vowed. Jonah 2 verse 9. And the Bible says, and the Lord spake unto the fish, verse 10. And it vomited out Jonah, where? On dry land. It didn't vomit him into water to swim. It didn't vomit him where they have to rescue him again. Vomited him upon dry land. The Bible says in Psalms 40, verse 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Out of the miry clay. And set my feet upon a rock. And established my goings. God is not talking of just delivering you. He's bringing you out to set you up and accelerate you forward. Am I talking to somebody here? He didn't leave Jonah inside water. Brought him out and put him on land and said, go my boy. From bottom of the ocean to an established position. I don't care where they buried you. Buried your umbilical cord. Buried the juju that had been troubling you. Buried whatever is burying your destiny. Your vow can resurrect all of them. And bring you onto the solid rock and accelerate you into the place of prepared blessings in Jesus' mighty name. I am talking to somebody who had come to the point where he felt my own case is finished. Can it be more finished than somebody in the belly of the whale at the bottom of the sea? But God, by the mystery, of the piece of wood that causes the axe head to flute. Your vow brought him out and set him on solid land. Your history and your story will yet be told as you key into and begin to utilize the mystery of making and paying of vows. When life throws you an unexpected curveball, People who are champions and mature Christians often write the ship of their destiny by making powerful vows, life-changing vows. What do I mean by life throwing you a curveball? If some of you played table tennis in your days, does anybody here, did anybody here play table tennis? There's a way they will return the ball to you with a twist like this. If you put bat to send it back, once the ball touches the bat, it will go away there. <laughs> but you were hitting it to go forward. No, there was a curve in the way the man who returned the ball returned it. He didn't just return it direct. He curved it. And life throws people curve ball. When curve ball lands in your court, everything scatters. The normal is aborted. Am I talking to somebody here? The expected does not work anymore. And from time to time, life throws everybody a curveball. From time to time, it happens. That is when we know who our champions are, who are babies. It is at such times when there's confusion everywhere. You don't know what to do next. It came out of the blues. Look at Job. Look at Job. One day, the richest man of his day. One day, he had how many children? Seven or eight? And the other day, he had 7,000 cattle, 10,000 this one, 20,000. He was the richest in every way. That same day, house left. Children died. Cattle were stolen. Everything finished and sickness descended upon him within 24 hours. What happened? Somebody say curve ball. The man was in disaster, disarray. He didn't know what to do. But what did Job respond? Or how did Job respond? Amen. Job 22, 26. For then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty and shall lift up thine face unto the Lord. Job responded with a set of strategies, not one. That's why he said, the soldier that only knows how to use rifle is under-equipped and under-prepared. 
The soldier that has and knows how to use pistol and where to use it, rifle and where to use it, bazooka and where to use it, ammon car and where to drive it into and how to use it, and there's cod missile as well. That's a very dangerous soldier. Rambo will fly helicopter. Rambo will use cod missile like it. Rambo will use every usable. If it is knife, he's there. Am I talking to somebody here? That is an equipped soldier. And Job was an equipped soldier. He wasn't a bomb boy. The Bible says, first of all, confronted by disaster, he still put his delight in the Almighty and lifted up his face unto God. Nothing shakes me from your presence. Thou shalt make thy prayer. He went into prayer straight. Disaster all around prayer. And he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. So he went into vows as well. Thou shalt also decree a thing. Hear me. There is a jara that God gives to people who pay vows. When you make and pay vows, you become a person. Decreeing is ruling by legislation. Governmental authority. When you speak to situations and situations bow to you, submit to you, it's not everybody's portion. It is a portion of those who make and pay vows. Am I talking to somebody here? Because the Bible says here, you shall make your prayers unto him, he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also. The word also means if the first thing I talked about has not been done, then the also cannot follow. Thou shalt also decree a thing when? After you have paid your vows. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Hear me, child of God. The Bible says, can I see Psalm 65 verse 5 quickly please? Psalm 65 verse 5, quick, quick. Psalm 65 5, scripture. Did you go to buy the Bible? Oh, thank you very much. By terrible things in righteousness, will thou answer us, O God of salvation? Praise God. Not, that's not the scripture I want. And thou shalt decree a thing. It shall be established unto thee. Praise the Lord. Where does the Bible say, hold on, hold on, hold on, let me find the scripture. Concerning the works of my hand, do what? Command ye me. Concerning. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45 verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands command ye not everybody can do this the only people God allows are those who pay their vows am I talking to somebody here command ye me because in the scripture we're just looking about looking at in Job Job 22 28 27 says you shall pay your vows, then you shall decree. A decree is a command. You shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee by who? By God. Concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. And he says, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Meaning that if darkness had come upon you, as you decree, light will break out again. We see Job 29 verse 2. Job lamented, oh that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. Verse 3, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, my prosperity was his light, my success was his light, my fame was his light. I was the richest man of the east by the light of God. Then suddenly overnight the light quenched. Am I talking to somebody here? But the Bible says, by the mystery of the vow, you decree a thing and light will shine again. You decree a thing and darkness will disappear. You restore your light by the mystery of your vow. 
I don't care what darkness has come upon your life. I don't care how suddenly it came. I don't care the curveball that was thrown at you. I don't care where the disappointment came from. Do something with a vow. Make a vow that is powerful. Your ship is already sinking. It will float again. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The thing came suddenly and punctured the ship of your life. And the thing is listing and sinking with a vow. Correct it and heal it and sail forward. That's why I said that powerful men who understand what is going on. When life shocks them with the kind of shock that knocks others down permanently. They take a vow out of their pocket and hold it up to Jehovah and say, I give it to you if you rectify the situation and Jehovah enters their boats. Praise the living God. I said praise the living God. The result is what then? The same Job 22 we're reading said in 28, thou shalt also decree a thing, it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy, thy ways. Verse 29. When men are cast down, then thou shalt say, there's a lifting up, and it shall save the humble person. We saw the strategies engaged by Job. You will have your delight in the Lord always. He never shook from his confidence in the Lord. You will lift up your face unto the Lord. His expectancy and trust was placed confidently in God only. He will, you will make your prayers. Don't shut your mouth. Keep praying. And make and pay your vows unto him. Then you will decree a thing. There are other things that we talked about last week. Get the teaching of last week. You will see it. No wonder David. Ah, David. David, the sweet psalmist. David, a man who knew God experientially. David, who escaped much. David, who achieved much, was a man who repeatedly and regularly engaged the immense power of deliverance available through the vow. Psalms 56 verse 11, In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Verse 12, I must perform my vows to you, O God. That is why I'm not afraid. When fear comes, I make another vow and I turn the situation around. I will render thanks offerings to you. So not only pay my vow, but I will also add offerings of thanksgiving. Psalms 50, 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon him, upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Please take notes. English is empirical. The whole story starts from 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. This implies that if you don't pay vows, then please don't expect help when you call. Anybody who keeps making vows and not paying them, it is like the man crying wolf, wolf, wolf. On the day wolf really comes, you will cry. Nobody will come. Am I talking to somebody here? Jehovah says, and call upon me in the day of trouble. After doing what? After paying your vows. I will answer you. I will deliver you so that you praise me once more. David was a man who understood and applied that regularly. Again and again in tight situations, he will make another vow to God. God will deliver him, he will pay his vow promptly. Psalm 61 verse 4, I will abide in, the, in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. You have heard my vows. You have heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. There are two interpretations which I am confident are valid here. Number one, you have heard me when I made my vows. But number two, you have heard the voice of my vow. The vow has a voice. The vow has what? A voice. The vow you have made to God and honored develops a voice that speaks for you. And what does it speak? I believe it speaks Isaiah 66, verses 6 and 7. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold thy peace day nor night. 
Yeah, that ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish and make Jerusalem a praise on the earth. Your vows made and paid, develop a voice. The more of them you make and pay, develop voices speaking to God. What are they speaking? Make him a praise in the earth. Make him succeed. Establish him. He understands. That is why I believe David, whom God called a man after his own heart, nobody in the Bible made vows and paid vows.